In today's video, I'm gonna teach you how I go over routine lab work with my patients, how I explain it to them, what I kind of point out, what we talk about as we go through it. Lab work is something we do all the time in healthcare, but I feel like it's very rarely explained to patients. So I thought I'd share with you how I at least attempt to do that. If you're new here, welcome. I'm Liz, I'm a family nurse practitioner. I work in primary care. So we're gonna go over labs that would typically be drawn at a physical. This is actually my lab work from my physical. So we'll go through it, talk about it together. We will be covering specific specific labs. However, I think the concept can kind of extend to a number of different labs, depending on what specialty and what setting you're working in. Some of the tips would be useful no matter what. In case you're interested, the labs we will be looking at today are a CBC with differential, a comprehensive metabolic panel, some thyroid labs, a lipid panel, and a hemoglobin A1C. Now, obviously, all of these wouldn't necessarily be drawn for everybody, and your practice may differ in what they prefer to do as general screening, but this pretty much aligns with what I do in practice. I don't necessarily do an A1C on everybody if I'm not particularly worried about that, but it's thrown in there. So I figured we'd talk about it. All right, let's hop over and see how healthy I am. <laughs> okay, first things first. First thing I always make sure to do is print off my labs. And I like printing off labs for a couple of reasons. One, it gives you something to physically look at with them. You're not pulling up a computer screen or you know talking to them about the labs that they can't actually see. They can take them home with them, which they sometimes like. That way, if they need to make copies to bring it to other providers, such as their cardiologist, they already have a copy with them and they don't have to worry about obtaining one. And it allows you to write notes on it, which is huge because usually, you're gonna be writing down some recommendations. It just gives them a scrap piece of paper. You can highlight things, you can circle, you can write, explain. It gives you a really good medium to do that so they can take notes and you can really make it a more interactive activity rather than I'm sitting here on my laptop reading to you what your labs are and you're not really comprehending what's going on or what like or what the reference ranges are, any of that. I've just found it hugely, hugely beneficial to print off the labs, bring them into the patient room with me and go over them that way. I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from it. Second thing I recommend doing is highlighting the abnormal lab values or the ones you're particularly paying attention to because yes, they'll likely be bolded on the piece of paper, but that really doesn't stand out a lot. I found going through and highlighting brings attention to it. It makes it really easy for the patients to see, hey, this is something we need to pay attention to and it brings your attention do it so you don't forget when you're scrolling through it that you have to talk about it. And the third thing I like to do is write little notes on it as we're talking it through things. So I'll bring a pen with me into the room and I'll write next to the, some of the labs blood sugar. And if we're talking about, are we watching for diabetes? I'll write diabetes next to it, just so that it jogs their memory. If we're talking about their liver panel, I'll write liver next to the liver labs and kidneys next to their kidney labs. It also just gives me an opportunity to write notes like we talked about earlier when something comes up and we need to chat about it a bit more. And once upon a time, I wanted to be an elementary school teacher and part of that still lives deep inside of me. So I do use like smiley faces. I haven't gone to the sticker method yet, but I do use smiley faces on things that are improved Moving or things that are good. Okay, so that's my pretty much my setup. Now we're ready to go into the room and take a look at these labs. Nobody judge me for any of these. I figured this was the safest way. It was just to use my own labs. All right, so now we're pretend we're in the room. You're sitting in your nice comfy chair. I usually have patients get down off of the exam table and I have them sit in the chair and I scooch my little rolly chair right up next to them. That way we're all looking at the same thing and it's kind of a shared experience and they don't feel like they're up on some pedestal being judged. Oh, I forgot. One side note before we dive into this. This is not necessarily the most scientifically perfect description for all of these lab values, but it's what I have found works best for getting the point across, which is the general purpose of this entire exercise with patients. I'm not trying to teach them all the pathophysiology of all these things. Some of this stuff is not 100% perfectly accurate, so I don't want you to be sitting out there being like, that's not exactly what that, it's okay. It's okay. I'm getting the general point across. They're a microbiologist. We're gonna have a totally different conversation. The purpose of this is just I'm talking to someone with very little medical background. I want to get my general point across. This is how I explain it. So with that caveat, let's get started. All right, so let's go over your lab work real quick. This is just gonna be a real brief overview. Feel free to stop me at any point if you have any questions or you wanna talk about something a little bit more, but I just thought we would run through it real quick together. That way you understand why we drew them and kind of what we're looking at. All right, so the very first thing we look at is the CBC with differential and platelets. That's your complete blood count. Your white blood cells that fight infection, your red blood cells, you know, that carry the oxygen all throughout your body. With everything on this list, we want you to have enough, but not too many, kind of be in the sweet spot because things can happen if you're too low or too high. 
Obviously nothing on yours is flagged, so that's perfect. Going down the list super quick, your white blood cells, that fights infection for you. You have some on standby, but they're not overreacting about anything right now. The red blood cells you see next, that tells us they're all the right shape, size, and they can do their job well when they are the right shape and size. So we're happy there. And your platelets are what clot your blood so that you don't bleed out when you get a paper cut. The rest of these on here are just different types of white blood cells basically. Since none of yours are abnormal, we won't even go into that. The next thing we see on here is your complete metabolic panel. This looks at your liver, your kidneys, things that they filter out and that they produce. So the first one on here that's super important is your glucose. That's what we're gonna look at when we're screening for diabetes. Now yours is 92, so it's fine. We'd like it to be under 100. Now let's pretend for the sake of this video real quick that that number was 114. This is when I start introducing the diabetes concepts to my patients, usually they don't understand. They don't necessarily always understand why blood sugar is bad, why we wanna control it. So I usually ask them, hey, has anybody ever talked to you about why we wanna control our blood sugar? And most of the time they say no. So then we have this brief spiel. This is not my diabetes spiel, this is just my blood sugar spiel. Very toned down, I just want them to kind of get the point. So I usually tell them, sugar is a very large, coarse molecule. It's kind of like one of those pokeballs that falls off of the trees. And as it's flowing through your veins, it's beating your veins up along the way. And if your number is more than 100, it's much, much more damaging because it's kind of like congested. So they're all bumping off each other and bumping off the walls of your veins. And they can actually get so inflamed and scarred that in the small parts of your bodies, like your fingers, your toes, your feet, where the, blood, the, where the veins get narrower and narrower, the inflammation gets so bad that you can lose some of your blood flow. So in the case of someone with diabetes, their blood sugar is always high. They have a lot of those really rough molecules floating around and you might've heard of someone having lost feeling in their feet if they're diabetic. And this is why those nerves and their feet are not getting the blood that they need down there because of all the damage to the tissue caused by the really sharp sugar molecules. Another thing that happens when you have high blood sugar is while your blood's flowing through your veins, it gets to your kidney. And your kidneys really don't like to be beat up, but sugar really beats your kidneys up. It's a sensitive organ it starts to break the fil it starts to injure the filter that the kidney is. So the kidney just filters your blood and it helps you make your pee. But you're really starting to beat up that kidney filter with these large sugar molecules. And as the filter gets more and more beat up, it stops working as well. We can't filter out medicines quite as well. Different things start leaking into our urine. And that's when you hear of people getting kidney failure from having diabetes because the sugar molecules have beat up their kidney, essentially. So that's kind of why we wanna control your blood sugar. Next, I just touch on some of the things they can do to lower their blood sugar really briefly. Having a well-balanced diet, I never go down the you can never eat sugar again path because that's just not helpful. And then exercise, any kind of movement because I talk about how muscles really like sugar and they like, they'll use it and it's not laying around the body that way. So that's kind of my very brief synopsis of how I tackle glucose. I will start more of a deep dive if the number is very, very high or if I get their A1C back and it is indicating that they are diabetic. Now it's not next on the list, but let's, while we're talking about this, I usually do flip to the hemoglobin A1C since they are so related. So here's how we talk about the hemoglobin A1C. Now we know your blood sugar is a little bit high, but that just shows us what it was that one day when you were fasting. A really good way to understand what your blood sugar has been like over a longer period of time is your hemoglobin A1C. And this number shows us what your blood sugar on average has been for the last three months. Now, I always convert for them their hemoglobin A1C into the glucose number, if that makes sense. And there's tons of conversion charts over on Google. I'll leave a link to the website I use a lot down below. I stick to one number and I usually just go with the glucose because it's what they're already familiar with. So I would convert an A1C of you know seven into a blood sugar number so they can look at it and understand my average blood sugar that I get is you know 194. I do talk about their actual hemoglobin A1C number and as we get more, you know, if they've had diabetes for a long time, they're familiar with that number, you know they well, they know where they wanna be under. But initially I convert it for them and we just compare. And if that number is high, then we can have more of a diabetes conversation. But again, I just let them know there is a way to monitor and we really like this A1C because it gives us a better picture rather than just, hey, you might've had a day where you ate a bunch of cake the day before. All right, going back to the labs. Then we start going down the list, talking about your creatinine, your EGFR. Those are indicators of how well your kidneys are functioning. So none of those are elevated. They look just fine. We're not worried about how your kidneys are functioning. I start having the conversation as it, your EGFR usually reaches around 60. I start to say, now we're going to start to watch your filter because your kidney filter is showing us that it is not filtering quite as well. You can tie this back in with the blood sugar thing. I encourage them to drink 
lots and lots of water. I also remind them that kidney function typically declines with age. So if we're looking at a trend over the years and they see it slowly going down, I remind them that this is what we expect. They're not doing anything wrong. They're just aging. Continuing going down, we talk a little bit about sodium, potassium, chlor. We talk about all of our electrolytes and if all of them are normal, I just say these are the electrolytes that you're your kidney helps regulate your electrolytes and it's doing a great job because they're all within normal limits. Your calcium is another one I start kind of pause and talk about for a second. If it's below nine, four-ish, I usually recommend a calcium supplement, 500 milligrams a day. I would jot that down on the paper with them. Calcium is super important because if our body doesn't have enough, it takes it out of our bones and we need our bones to be strong. So this just helps us have strong bones. This is really a long game. You know, as we get older, you don't wanna fall and fracture your hip because your bone density is not that great. So we have that brief conversation. Moving on, all of these labs here down at the bottom show us how your liver is functioning. No abnormality, so you're doing great there. Next. We come up on our lipid panel and this is just your cholesterol. I usually just ask them if anyone's ever really talked to them about cholesterol and why they want to control it. It always blows me away how many people are like, no, I just really know I should keep my numbers down. This is maybe the most important lab I talk about with my patients because I found that so many people are like, oh, okay, that makes a little bit more sense. So I go up, I approach it the following way. Your cholesterol, you'll see here at the top, your total cholesterol is made up of all these other different components of cholesterol. Now, why is cholesterol important? So I want you to think of your veins as pipes, sending blood all over your body and your body needs blood because so it can get oxygen, which keeps you alive. Now, the thing we don't want to happen with your blood pipe is for it to get clogged. If it gets clogged and that's happening in your brain, that's a stroke. If it gets clogged in your heart, that's a heart attack. In your lung, that's a pulmonary embolism. In your leg, your leg falls off. You get my point? Great. Now the big ones I want us to look at here, let's go to the very bottom, are your low density cholesterol. That's when you have pipes and there's all the sludge building around and you pour some Drano in there. You wanna get that sludge off so the pipe is flowing freely. That's your low density cholesterol. Builds up on the side, it causes irritation, but it can really clog your pipe. You want low gunk. So the LDL is the gunk. Sometimes I'll even write gunk on the paper, guys. Low gunk. Now, good news, we also have good cholesterol or HDL, high density lipoproteins. If, I want you to think of that kind of as little marbles that shoot through your pipe and knock the gunk off the side. How do you get more marbles, less gunk? The high density lipoproteins comes from diet, exercise, just like that will raise your HDL, it will lower your LDL, it'll also lower your blood sugar, which we already talked about. But food, there are certain foods that will actually help you raise the marble, raise the HDL, the marbles, and keep your gunk a little bit lower. So that's things like olive oil, eating almonds, fish with omega-3 fatty acids, avocado, whole grains, pretty much if you look up a Mediterranean diet, sometimes I'll print them off a guideline on Mediterranean diet, that's what's gonna raise your good cholesterol. So we wanna keep that in balance. So on here it shows us we'd like your HDL to be greater than 40. Really, if you're a lady, we'd like it to be greater than 50, and I'm thrilled if it's greater than 60, and then I ask them if that makes sense. I usually don't talk extensively about triglycerides, I just say it's another component of cholesterol that can, if it is high, we talk about, you know, do they have an alcohol intake, but I briefly mention, you know, triglycerides Cholesterides, just like anything else, come from if you are ingesting more calories, too many calories, if you are not exercising, all the other things that kind of raise cholesterol, blood sugar that we've already talked about. And at this point, we've talked about those things, so it's really easy to just, they already understand that concept. That is cholesterol. And the final one we do a lot is your TSH. So this is your TSH, your thyroid stimulating hormone. Your thyroid lives right here in your neck and it has some things to do with your metabolism. Now, when we're talking about our thyroid, I usually do go into a brief description about how your thyroid works. So your thyroid lives right here and it produces thyroid hormones that in a way keep your metabolism going. If your thyroid isn't working properly and it's not producing enough, you're real tired, you're probably cranky, you feel you get cold really easily, but if your thyroid's overacting and it's producing way too much hormone, that's when you have people's eyes kind of bulging out of their head, they're real anxious, they're jittery, they get hot all the time. So we want you to be in that happy middle place. But your thyroid's kind of weird in how we draw labs on it. We don't measure directly what your thyroid is producing. That's not super reliable. So your thyroid is a factory, but it doesn't get to decide how much products it makes. 
your brain gets to decide how much product the thyroid factory makes. So we actually look at what the brain is telling your thyroid to do in order to understand, hey, is everything going well? So this is kind of confusing, but hang in with me. The way we look and see how your thyroid is doing is we actually look at what the brain, the boss, is telling the thyroid to do because it works on a feedback loop. So if your thyroid isn't doing a very good job and it's not spitting out enough, thyroid hormone, your brain is going to start screaming at it. It's going to be like, you need to pick up the pace. Let's go. And we're looking at what's happening between brain and thyroid. Your brain releases thyroid stimulating hormone, which is the message from the boss to the thyroid. And if your thyroid's doing a bad job, your brain is screaming. So your thyroid stimulating hormone is going to be high. That means your thyroid level is low. And we know if this is screaming, something is wrong with this this is not producing enough, your thyroid levels are low. If your thyroid is going wild, that factory is just chugging along and your body doesn't quite need all that it's producing, your brain is gonna start sending very few messages down to your thyroid because it's like, oh, oh we've, so, we've done too much. We're gonna get real quiet and just let your thyroid kind of calm down. So then your thyroid numbers will be very low, like 0.1, because your brain is not trying to send any more messages to your thyroid, it wants it to stop. So that's why we see the inverse relationship. High TSH numbers means your thyroid's not quite working right. Low TSH numbers means maybe your thyroid's working a little bit too well. Sometimes it's just working well on its own and the factory workers have taken over. And we've got to kind of deep dive into why that is happening. But that's how, in a nutshell, I explain thyroid function because patients are usually very confused if they see a high number, but I'm telling them their thyroid numbers are actually low. A high TSH means an actual low thyroid number. That's kind of how I try to explain it. So hopefully that made sense to you. That one's definitely one where if the numbers are off, we have to spend a wee bit more time because it is a confusing concept with the whole negative feedback loop. All right, and that wraps up our basic lab review. This was obviously much chattier because I was explaining everything in really detail to you. I can get through this in my office with my patients in five minutes and you'll get so much faster at it. So I know right now it's like, oh my gosh, you just made this like, 20 some minute video on explaining labs. I don't have time for that. It only really takes five minutes in practice. I just feel like I was explaining a lot. All right, so hopefully that was a little bit helpful for you if you want to explain labs to your patients, just kind of to walk through them and give you maybe some language that you can use to simplify things. And like I said, absolutely, if pa your patient is on that level where you're gonna like deep dive into the real path though, go for it. I love those conversations. That's why I always like to ask my patients what they do for a living before I explain to an anesthesiologist what your cholesterol pipe is doing because that's embarrassing. If this video is helpful for you and you want to see more like it, I'd love if you would subscribe to my channel. I do content videos like this on every Tuesday, usually on nursing and NP things. And then on Saturdays, like I said earlier, I have a vlog where I just document my life in work and out of work as a family nurse practitioner. I also have an Instagram if you want to head over there. That way we can message and I talk about what I see at work and mention little fun facts I'm learning along the way because I'm still in my first year of NP ship and it is, I'm learning so much every day. It's crazy. Question of the day is what's the craziest lab value you've ever seen. I have seen someone with a blood sugar of 1,100 and they were actually, I've seen some alive. And on the flip side of that, I've had a patient that had a blood sugar of seven and they were conscious. I was <laughs> amazed. <laughs> they weren't conscious for long, but when I got, when I checked it, it was seven. Let me know your wildest lab value you've ever seen down below and check out some of these videos I'll leave here at the end that might be interesting to you as well. Hope you have a fabulous rest of your day and I'll see you next time. Bye.